This is the Sabbath School lesson for the first quarter, 2022. Welcome to Lesson 4, Jesus, Our Faithful Brother, ready for teaching on January 22. It's from the series In These Last Days, The Message of Hebrews, authored by Dr. Felix Cortez, Associate Professor of New Testament Literature in the Seventh-day Adventist Theological Seminary at Andrews University. And I'm your reader for today, Dr. Percy Harold. Sabbath afternoon, January 15. Before we start, let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you that we have a Saviour. We have a Saviour who not only is the Son of God, not only is He divine, but He is our brother. And Lord, as we open your word today, we pray that your Holy Spirit will guide us, that we may accept Jesus as our Saviour and as our brother, and that as we study this important lesson today, we may come to understand how great and how deep his love is for us. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Our memory text this week is Hebrews chapter 2 and verse 14. Inasmuch then as the children have partaken of flesh and blood, he himself likewise shared in the same, that through death he might destroy him who had the power of death, that is, the devil. Let's read that again, Hebrews 2.14. Inasmuch then as the children have partaken of flesh and blood, he himself likewise shared in the same, that through death he might destroy him who had the power of death, that is, the devil. Hebrews 1 talks of Jesus as the Son of God, the ruler over the angels, and the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person, in chapter 1, verse 3. In Hebrews 2, Jesus is the Son of Man, who was made lower than the angels, and who adopted human nature with all its frailty, even to the point of death, as we read in Hebrews 2, 7. You have made him a little lower than the angels, you have crowned him with glory, and honour, and set him over the works of your hands. In Hebrews 1, God says about Jesus, You are my son, in verse 5. In Hebrews 2, Jesus refers to human children as his brethren, in verse 12. In Hebrews 1, the Father declares the Son's divine sovereignty, as we read in Hebrews 1, verses 8 to 12. But to the Son, he says, Your throne, O God, is for ever and ever. A scepter of righteousness is the scepter of your kingdom. You have loved righteousness and hated lawlessness. Therefore God, your God, has anointed you with the oil of gladness more than your companions. And you, Lord, in the beginning laid the foundation of the earth, and the heavens are are the work of your hands. They will perish, but you remain. And they will all grow old like a garment, like a cloak. You will fold them up, and they will be changed. But you are the same, and your years will not fail. In Hebrews 2, the Son affirms his faithfulness to the Father in verse 13. And again I will put my trust in him, and again here am I and the children whom God has given me. In Hebrews 1, Jesus is the divine Lord, creator, sustainer, and sovereign. In Hebrews 2, Jesus is the human high priest, merciful and faithful. In summary, the presentation of Jesus as a faithful and merciful brother is depicted in the description of the Son as the ultimate manifestation of the eternal Creator God, as we read in the first four verses of the book. Hebrews 1, beginning at verse 1, God, who at various times and in various ways spoke in time past to the fathers by the prophets, has in these last days spoken to us by his Son, whom he has appointed heir of all things, through whom also he made the worlds, who, being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person, and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had, by himself, purged our sins, sat down down at the right hand of the majesty on high, having become so much better than the angels, as he has by inheritance obtained a more excellent name than they.
Sunday, January 16, The Brother as a Redeemer Read Leviticus chapter 25, verses 25 to 27, and verses 47 to 49. Who could redeem a person who had lost his property or his liberty because of poverty? Leviticus 25, beginning at verse 25, If one of your brethren becomes poor and has sold some of his possession, and if his redeeming relative comes to redeem it, then he may redeem what his brother sold. Or, if the man has no one to redeem it, but he himself becomes able to redeem it, then let him count the years since its sale, and restore the remainder to the man to whom he sold it, that he may return it to his possession. And in the same chapter, Leviticus 25, beginning at verse 47, Now if a sojourner or stranger close to you becomes rich, and one of your brethren who dwells by him becomes poor, and sells himself to the stranger or sojourner close to you, or to a member of the stranger's family, after he is sold he may be redeemed again. One of his brothers may redeem him, or his uncle, or his uncle's son may redeem him, or any one who is near of kin to him and his family may redeem him, or, if he is able, he may redeem himself. The law of Moses stipulated that when a person was so poor that he had to sell his property or even himself in order to survive, he would receive that property or his liberty back after fifty years on the Jubilee year. The Jubilee year was a grand Sabbath year in which debts were forgiven, properties were reclaimed, and liberty was proclaimed to the captives. Fifty years was a long time to wait, however. That's why the law of Moses also stipulated that the nearest relative could pay the part that was still owed, and thus ransom his relative much sooner. The nearest relative also was the one who guaranteed that justice was done in the case of murder. He was the avenger of the blood who would pursue the murderer of his close relative and punish him, as we read in Numbers 35, 9 to 15. Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the children of Israel and say to them, When you cross the Jordan into the land of Canaan, then you shall appoint cities to be cities of refuge for you that the manslayer who kills any person accidentally may flee there. They shall be cities of refuge for you from the avenger, that the manslayer may not die until he stands before the congregation in judgment. And of the cities which you give, you shall have six cities of refuge. You shall appoint three cities on this side of the Jordan, and three cities you shall appoint in the land of Canaan, which will be cities of refuge. These six cities shall be for refuge for the children of Israel, for the stranger, and for the sojourner among them, that any one who kills a person accidentally may flee there. Read Hebrews two fourteen to 16 How is Jesus, and how are we, described in this passage? Hebrews 2, beginning at verse 14. Inasmuch then as the children have partaken of flesh and blood, he himself likewise shared in the same, that through death he might destroy him who had the power of death, that is, the devil, and release those who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. For indeed, he does not give aid to angels, but he does give aid to the seed of Abraham." This passage describes us as slaves of the devil, but Jesus as our Redeemer. When Adam sinned, human beings fell under the power of Satan. As a result, we did not have the power to resist sin, as we read in Romans seven fourteen to 24 For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am carnal, sold under sin. For what I am doing I do not understand. For what I will to do, that I do not practice, but what I hate, that I do. If then I do what I will not to do, I agree with the law that it is good. But now it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells in me. For I know that in me, that is in my flesh, nothing good dwells. For to will is present with me, but how to perform what is good I do not find. For the good that I will to do, I do not. But the evil I will not to do, that I practice. 
Now, if I do what I will not to do, it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells in me. I find then a law that evil is present with me, the one who wills to do good, for I delight in the law of God according to the inward man, but I see another law in my members, warring against the law of my mind, and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin, which is in my members. O wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? Worse, there was a death penalty that our transgression required, which we could not pay, as we read in Romans 6.23. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Thus our situation was apparently hopeless. Jesus, however, adopted our human nature and became flesh and blood like us. He became our nearest relative and redeemed us. He was not ashamed to call us brothers, as we read in Hebrews 2.11 in the English Standard Version. Paradoxically, by taking our nature and redeeming us, Jesus revealed his divine nature as well. In the Old Testament, the true Redeemer of Israel, their closest relative, is Yahweh, as we read in Psalm 19.14. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my strength and my Redeemer. And Isaiah 41.14, Fear not, you worm Jacob, you men of Israel. I will help you, says the Lord, and your Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel. And Isaiah 43.14, Thus says the Lord your Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel, For your sake I will send to Babylon, and bring them all down as fugitives, the Chaldeans who rejoice in their ships. And Isaiah 44, verse 22, I have blotted out like a thick cloud your transgressions, and like a cloud your sins. Return to me, for I have redeemed you. And Jeremiah 31 verse 11, For the Lord has redeemed Jacob, and ransomed him from the hand of one stronger than he. And Hosea chapter 13 verse 14, I will ransom them from the power of the grave, I will redeem them from death. O death, I will be your plagues, O grave, I will be your destruction. Pity is hidden from my eyes. And so to finish today, what are ways that you can learn to experience more deeply that reality of just how close Christ can be to you? Why is having this experience so important to your faith? Monday, January 17. Not ashamed to call them brothers. Hebrews says that Jesus was not ashamed to call us his brethren, as we read in Hebrews 2.11, for both he who sanctifies and those who are being sanctified are all of one, for which reason he is not ashamed to call them brethren. Despite being one with God, Jesus embraces us as part of his family. This solidarity contrasts with the public shaming that the readers of Hebrews suffered in their communities, as you read in Hebrews 10.33, partly while you were made a spectacle both by reproaches and tribulations, and partly while you became companions of those who were so treated. Read Hebrews 11.24-26. In what way do Moses' decisions exemplify what Jesus did for us? Hebrews 11, beginning at verse 24, By faith Moses, when he became of age, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the passing pleasures of sin, esteeming the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures in Egypt, for he looked to the reward. Have you imagined what it meant for Moses to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter? He was a powerful figure in the most powerful empire at the time. 
He received the highest civil and military training and became a remarkable character. Stephen says that Moses was mighty in words and in deeds in Acts 7.22. Ellen G. White also says that he was a favourite with the armies of Egypt and that Pharaoh determined to make his adopted grandson his successor on the throne in Patriarchs and Prophets, page 245. Yet, Moses abandoned all this privilege when he chose to identify himself with the Israelites, a slave nation without education and power. Read Matthew ten thirty-two and 33, 2 Timothy 1, 8 and 12, and Hebrews thirteen twelve to 15. What does God ask from us? First of all, Matthew 10, verse 32 and 33, Therefore, whoever confesses me before men, him I will also confess before my Father who is in heaven. But whoever denies me before men, him I will also deny before my Father who is in heaven. Second Timothy 1, verse 8, Therefore do not be ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor of me his prisoner, but share with me in the sufferings for the gospel according to the power of God. And verse 12, For this reason I also suffered these things, nevertheless I am not ashamed, for I know whom I have believed, and am persuaded that he is able to keep what I have committed to him until that day. And Hebrews 13, verses 12 to 15, Therefore Jesus also, that he might sanctify the people with his own blood, suffered outside the gate. Therefore let us go forth to him outside the camp, bearing his reproach. For here we have no continuing city, for we seek the one to come. Therefore by him let us continually offer the sacrifice of praise to God, that is, the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to his name. This was part of the problem for the readers of Hebrews. After suffering persecution and rejection, many of them began to feel ashamed of Jesus. By their actions, some were in danger of putting Jesus to an open shame instead of honouring him, as it says in Hebrews 6, Verse 6, if they fell away, to renew them again to repentance, since they crucify again for themselves the Son of God, and put him to an open shame. Thus, Paul constantly calls the readers to hold fast the confession of their faith, as we read in Hebrews 4.14. Seeing then that we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast. Our confession and Hebrews 10.23, let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. God wants us to recognize Jesus as our God and our brother. As our Redeemer, Jesus has paid our debt. As our brother, Jesus has shown us the way that we should live in order that we will, as it says in Romans 8.29, be conformed to the image of the Son, so that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. And so to finish the day, think for a moment about the decision that Jesus had to make in order to embrace us as siblings. Why was what Jesus did so much more condescending for himself than what Moses did? And what does this teach us about God's love for us? Tuesday, January 18. Flesh and blood like us. Hebrews says that Jesus adopted our human nature so that he could represent us and could die for us. As you read in Hebrews 2.9, But we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels, for the suffering of death crowned with glory and honour, that he, by the grace of God, might taste death for everyone. And Hebrews 2. Verses 14 to 16, Inasmuch then as the children have partaken of flesh and blood, he himself likewise shared in the same, that through death 
he might destroy him who had the power of death, that is, the devil, and release those who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. For indeed, he does not give aid to angels, but he does give aid to the seed of Abraham. And Hebrews 10 verses 5 to 10. Therefore, when he came into the world, he said, Sacrifice and offering you did not desire, but a body you have prepared for me. In burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin you had no pleasure. Then I said, Behold, I have come. In the volume of the book it is written of me to do your will, O God. Previously saying, Sacrifice and offering, burnt offerings and offerings for sin you did not desire, nor had pleasure in them, which are offered according to the law. Then he said, Behold, I have come to do your will, O God, to take away the first, that he may establish the second. By that will we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. Here is the foundation of the plan of salvation and our only hope for eternal life. Read Matthew 16.17, Galatians 1.16, 1 Corinthians 15.50 and Ephesians 6.12. To what deficiencies of human nature do these passages relate the expression flesh and blood? First of all, Matthew 16 and verse 17. Jesus answered and said to him, Blessed are you, Simon Bar-Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And Galatians 1.16, To reveal his Son in me, that I might preach him among the Gentiles, I do not immediately confer with flesh and blood. And 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 50. Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does corruption inherit incorruption. And Ephesians 6.12 For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. The expression flesh and blood emphasises the frailty of the human condition, its weakness in Ephesians 6.12, lack of understanding in Matthew 16.17 and Galatians 1.16, and subjection to death in 1 Corinthians 15.50, all of which we've just read. Hebrews says that Jesus was made like his brothers in all things in Hebrews 2.17. Therefore, in all things he had to be made like his brethren, that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God, to make propitiation for the sins of the people. This expression means that Jesus became fully human. Jesus did not simply look like or seem to be human. He truly was human, truly one of us. Hebrews also says, however, that Jesus was different from us regarding sin. First, Jesus did not commit sin, as we read in Hebrews 4.15, for we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. Secondly, Jesus had a human nature that was wholly innocent, unstained, separated from sinners, as we read in Hebrews 7.26. We all have sinned, and we all have evil tendencies. Our bondage to sin begins deep inside our very own nature. We are carnal, sold under sin, as we read in Romans 7, verse 14. But in Romans 7:15 to 20 we read, For what I am doing I do not understand, for what I will to do that I do not practice, but what I hate that I do. If then I do what I will not to do, I agree with the law that it is good. But now it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells in me. For I know that in me, that is in my flesh, nothing good dwells, for to will is present with me, but how to perform what is good I do not find. For the good that I will to do, I do not do, but the evil I will not to do, that I practice. Now, if I do what I will not to do, it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells in me. Pride and other sinful motivations often taint even our good actions. Jesus' nature, however, was not marred by sin. 
It had to be this way. If Jesus had been carnal, sold under sin like us, he also would have needed a saviour. Instead, Jesus came as a saviour and offered himself as a sacrifice without blemish to God for us, as we read in Hebrews 7, 26 to 28, for such a high priest was fitting for us who is holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners, and has become higher than the heavens, who does not need daily, as those high priests, to offer up sacrifices, first for his own sins and then for the people's, for this he did once for all when he offered up himself. For the law appoints as high priests men who have weaknesses, but the word of the oath which came after the law appoints the Son who has been perfected for ever. And Hebrews 9.14 How much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal Spirit offered himself without spot to God, cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? Then Jesus destroyed the power of the devil by dying as the sinless offering for our sins, thus making possible our forgiveness and reconciliation with God, as we read in Hebrews 2, verses 14 to 17, Inasmuch then as the children have partaken of flesh and blood, he himself likewise shared in the same, that through death he might destroy him who had the power of death, that is, the devil, and release those who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. For indeed, he does not give aid to angels, but he does give aid to the seed of Abraham. Therefore, in all things he had to be made like his brethren, that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God, to make propitiation for the sins of the people. Jesus also broke the power of sin by giving us the power to live a righteous life through his fulfilment of the new covenant promises to write the law in our hearts. As we read in Hebrews 8.10, For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my laws in their mind and write them on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Thus, Jesus has defeated the enemy and effectively liberated us so that we can now serve the living God, as we read in Hebrews 9.14. How much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal Spirit offered himself without spot to God, cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? Satan's final destruction, meanwhile, will come as the final judgment as we read in Revelation 20, verses 1 to 3 and verse 10. Then I saw an angel coming down from heaven, having the key to the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. He laid hold of the dragon, that serpent of old, which is the devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years. And he cast him into the bottomless pit and shut him up and set a seal on him so that he should deceive the nations no more till the thousand years were finished. But after these things he must be released for a little while. And verse 10, The devil who deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone, where the beast and the false prophet are, and they will be tormented day and night, for ever and ever. And so to finish today. Since we have the promise of victory through Jesus, why do so many of us still struggle with sin? What are we doing wrong? And more important, how can we start living up to the high calling we have in Christ? Wednesday, January 19. Perfected through sufferings. Read Hebrews 2, verses 10, 17 and 18, and Hebrews 5, verses 8 and 9. What was the function of suffering in Jesus' life? First of all, Hebrews 2, verse 10. For it was fitting for him, for whom are all things and by whom are all things, in bringing many sons to glory, to make the captain of their salvation perfect, 
through sufferings. And verses 17 and 18, Therefore, in all things he had to be made like his brethren, that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God, to make propitiation for the sins of the people. For in that he himself has suffered being tempted, he is able to aid those who are tempted. And Hebrews 5, verses 8 and 9, Though he was a son, Yet he learned obedience by the things which he suffered, and having been perfected, he became the author of eternal salvation to all who obey him. The Apostle says that God made Jesus perfect through sufferings. This expression is surprising. The author has said that Jesus is the radiance of the glory of God in the exact imprint of his nature in chapter 1, verse 3, and that he is sinless, spotless, undefiled, and holy in Hebrews 4, 15, for we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. And in chapter 7, verses 26 to 28, for such a high priest was fitting for us who is holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners, and has become a higher than the heavens, who does not need daily as those high priests to offer up sacrifices, first for his own sins and then for the people's, for this he did once for all when he offered up himself. For the law appoints as high priests men who have weaknesses, but the word of the oath which came after the law appoints the Son who has been perfected for ever. And Hebrews 9.14 How much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal Spirit offered himself without spot to God, cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? And Hebrews 10, verses 5 to 10. Therefore, when he came into the world, he said, Sacrifice and offering you did not desire, but a body you have prepared for me. In burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin you had no pleasure. Then I said, Behold, I have come. In the volume of the book it is written of me to do your will, O God. Previously saying, Sacrifice and offering, burnt offerings and offerings for sin, you did not desire, nor had pleasure in them, which are offered according to the law. Then he said, Behold, I have come to do your will, O God. He takes away the first, that he may establish the second. By that will we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. Jesus did not have to overcome any kind of moral or ethical imperfection. He was perfect both morally and ethically. Hebrews does say, however, that Jesus underwent a process of perfecting. That provided him with the means to save us. Jesus was perfected in the sense that he was equipped to be our Saviour. 1. Jesus was perfected through sufferings in order to become the captain of our salvation, as we've just read in Hebrews 2.10. Jesus had to die on the cross as a sacrifice so that the Father could have the legal means to save us. Jesus was the perfect sacrificial offering, the only one. As God, Jesus could judge us, but because of his sacrifice, Jesus also can save us. 2. Jesus learned obedience through sufferings, as we read in Hebrews 5, 8. Obedience was necessary for two things. First, obedience made his sacrifice acceptable, as we've just read in Hebrews 9, 14 and Hebrews 10, 5 to 10. Second, his sufferings enabled him to become our example, as we read in Hebrews 5, 9. Jesus learned obedience because he never experienced it before. As God... Whom would he have to obey? As the Eternal Son and one with God, he was obeyed as the ruler of the universe. Therefore, Jesus did not progress from disobedience to obedience, but from sovereignty and dominion to submission and obedience. The exalted Son of God became the obedient Son of Man. 3. Suffering temptation and being victorious enabled Jesus to be a merciful and faithful high priest, as we read in Hebrews 2, 17 and 18. Sufferings did not make Jesus more merciful. 
To the contrary, it was because of Jesus' mercy that he volunteered to die on the cross to save us to begin with, as we read in Hebrews 10, 5 to 10. And we're going to compare this with Romans chapter 5, verses 7 and 8. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet perhaps for a good man someone would even dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love toward us, in that, while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Yet it was through sufferings that the reality of Jesus' brotherly love was truly expressed and revealed. And so to finish today, if the sinless Jesus suffered, we as sinners surely will suffer as well. How can we learn to endure the tragedies of life while at the same time drawing hope and assurance from the Lord who has revealed his love to us in so many powerful ways? Thursday, January 20, The Brother as a Model Another reason Jesus adopted our human nature and lived among us was so that he could be our example, the only one who could model for us what is the right way to live before God. Read Hebrews 12, verses 1 to 4. According to the Apostle, how should we run the race of the Christian life? Hebrews 12, beginning at verse 1, Therefore we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, who, for the joy that was set before him, endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him who endured such hostility from sinners against himself, lest you become weary and discouraged in your souls. You have not yet resisted to bloodshed, striving against sin. In this passage, Jesus is the culmination of a long list of characters whom the Apostle provides as exemplars of faith. This passage calls Jesus the founder and perfecter of our faith. The Greek word archigos, founder, also can be translated pioneer. Jesus is the pioneer of the race in the sense that he runs ahead of the believers. In fact, Hebrews 6.20 calls Jesus our forerunner. Let's read that. Hebrews 6.20, where the forerunner has entered for us, even Jesus, having become high priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. The word perfecter gives the idea that Jesus had displayed faith in God in the purest form possible. This passage teaches both that Jesus is the first one to have run our race with success and that he is the one who perfected the art of what living by faith is all about. Hebrews 2.13 reads, And again I will put my trust in him, and again here am I and the children whom God has given me. What is happening here is that Jesus said that he would put his trust in God. This reference is an allusion to Isaiah 8, verses 17 and 18, which reads, And I will wait on the Lord who hides his face from the house of Jacob, and I will hope in him. Here am I and the children whom the Lord has given me. We are for signs and wonders in Israel from the Lord of hosts who dwells in Mount Zion. Isaiah spoke these words in the face of a terrible threat of invasion from northern Israel and Syria, as we read in Isaiah 7 verses 1 and 2. Now it came to pass in the days of Ahaz, the son of Jothan, the son of Isaiah, king of Judah, that Rezin, king of Syria, and Pekah, the son of Remaliah, king of Israel, went up to Jerusalem to make war against it, but could not prevail against it. And it was told to the house of David, saying, Syria's forces are deployed in Ephraim. So his heart and the heart of his people were moved as the trees of the woods were moved with 
the wind. His faith contrasted the lack of faith of Ahaz, the king that we read about in 2 Kings 16, verses 5 to 18. Then Rezin, king of Syria, and Pekah, the son of Remaliah, king of Israel, came up to Jerusalem to make war, and they besieged Ahaz, but could not overcome him. At that time, Rezin, king of Syria, captured Elath for Syria, and drove the men of Judah from Elath. Then the Edomites went to Elath, and dwell there to this day. So Ahaz sent messengers to tiglath pileser king of Assyria, saying, I am your servant and your son. Come up and save me from the hand of the king of Syria and from the hand of the king of Israel, who rise up against me. And Ahaz took the silver and gold that was found in the house of the Lord and in the treasuries of the king's house, and sent it as a present to the king of Assyria. So... The king of Assyria heeded him, for the king of Assyria went up against Damascus and took it, carried his people captive to Ker, and killed Rezin. Now King Ahaz went to Damascus to meet Tiglath-Pileser, king of Assyria, and saw an altar that was at Damascus. And King Ahaz sent to Urijah the priest the design of the altar and its pattern according to all its workmanship. Then Urijah the priest built an altar according to all that King Ahaz had sent from Damascus. So Urijah the priest made it before King Ahaz came back from Damascus. And when the king came back from Damascus, the king saw the altar, and the king approached the altar and made offerings on it. So he burnt his burnt offering and his grain offering, and he poured his drink offering and sprinkled the blood of his peace offerings on the altar. He also brought the bronze altar that was before the Lord from the front of the temple, from between the new altar and the house of the Lord, and put it on the north side of the new altar. Then King Ahaz commanded Urijah the priest, saying, On the great new altar burn the morning burnt offering and evening grain offering, the king's burnt sacrifice and his grain offering, with the burnt offering of all the people of the land, their grain offering and their drink offerings." and sprinkle on it all the blood of the burnt offering and all the blood of the sacrifice, and the bronze altar shall be for me to inquire by. Thus did Urijah the priest according to all that King Ahaz commanded. And King Ahaz cut off the panels of the carts and removed the lavers from them, and he took down the sea from the bronze oxen that were under it and put it on a pavement of stones. Also he removed the Sabbath pavilion, which had been built in the temple, and he removed the king's outer entrance from the house of the Lord on account of the king of Assyria. God had exhorted Ahaz to trust in him and to ask for a sign that he would deliver him. And we read about this in Isaiah 7, verses 1 to 11. Now it came to pass in the days of Ahaz the son of Jotham, the son of Uzziah, king of Judah, that Rezin, king of Syria, and Pekah, the son of Remaliah, king of Israel, went up to Jerusalem to make war against it, but could not prevail against it. And it was told to the house of David, saying, Syria's forces are deployed in Ephraim. So his heart and the heart of his people were moved as the trees of the woods are moved with the wind." Then the Lord said to Isaiah, Go up now to meet Ahaz, you and Shear Jashub, your son, at the end of the aqueduct from the upper pool on the highway to the fuller's field, and say to him, Take heed and be quiet. Do not fear to be faint-hearted, for these two stubs of smoking firebrands, for the fierce anger of Rezin and Syria and the son of Remaliah, Because Syria, Ephraim, and the son of Remaliah have plotted evil against you, saying, Let us go up against Judah and trouble it, and let us make a gap in its wall for ourselves, and set a king over them, the son of Tabal. Thus says the Lord God, It shall not stand, nor shall it come to pass. For the head of Syria is Damascus, and the head of Damascus is Rezin. Within sixty-five years Ephraim will be broken, so that it will not be a people. The head of Ephraim is Samaria, and the head of Samaria is Remaliah's son. If you will not believe, surely you shall not be established. Moreover, the Lord spoke again to Ahaz, saying, Ask a sign for yourself from the Lord your God. Ask it either in the depth or in the height above." God already had promised him as a son of David that he would protect Ahaz as his own son. 
Now, God graciously offered for Ahaz to confirm that promise with a sign from him. Ahaz, however, refused to ask for a sign and instead sent messengers to Tiglath-Pileser, king of Assyria, saying, I am your servant and your son, as we read in Second Kings 16.7. How sad! Ahaz preferred being the son of Tiglath-Pileser to being the son of God. Jesus, however, put his trust in God and in his promise that he would put his enemies under his feet, as we read in Hebrews 1.13, but to which of the angels has he ever said, Sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool? And Hebrews 10, verses 12 and 13. But this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down at the right hand of God, from that time waiting till his enemies are made his footstool. God has made the same promise to us, and we need to believe him, just as Jesus did, as we read in Romans 16.20. And the God of peace will crush Satan under your feet shortly. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Amen. And so to finish the day, how can we learn to put our trust in God by daily making choices that reflect this trust? What's the next important choice you need to make? And how can you be sure that it does reveal trust in God? Friday, January 21. Hebrews 2.13 contains the words of Jesus to his father talking about his brethren, writes Patrick Gray in Godly Fear, the Epistle to the Hebrews and Greco-Roman Critiques of Superstition, page 126. Here am I and the children God has given me. That's Hebrews 2.13. Patrick Gray suggests that Jesus is described here as the guardian of his brothers. The Roman system of tutela imperbarum determined that at their father's death, a tutor, often an older brother, became responsible for the care of minor children and their inheritance until they reached the age of majority, thus heightening the older brother's natural duty to take care of his younger siblings. End of quote. This explains why Hebrews refers to us both as the siblings of Jesus and as his children. As our older brother, Jesus is our tutor, our guardian and protector. In Selected Messages, Book 1, page 253, Ellen White writes, Christ came to the earth taking humanity and standing as man's representative to show in the controversy with Satan that man, as God created him, connected with the Father and the Son, could obey every divine requirement. And from the same author, the book Desire of Ages, page 649, in his life and lessons, Christ has given a perfect exemplification of the unselfish ministry which has its origin in God. God does not live for himself. By creating the world and by upholding all things, he is constantly ministering for others. He maketh his sun to rise on the evil and on the good, and sendeth rain on the just and on the unjust, we read in Matthew 5.45. This idea of ministry God has committed to his Son. Jesus was given to stand at the head of humanity, that by his example he might teach what it means to minister. And that brings us to our discussion questions for this week, and there are three of them. 1. Hebrews tells us that Jesus became our brother in order to save us. Think about what that means in terms of what God did in order to save us. Why then would turning our back on this amazing reality be such a tragic mistake? 2. Why is it important for us that Jesus was not born sold under sin as we are in Romans 7.14? Let's read that verse. For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am carnal, sold under sin. Think about Moses and why it was important for the Israelites that he was not a slave as they were. How does the story of Moses in a small way help us understand what Jesus has done for us? And three, 
dwell more on the role of suffering in our lives. Why must we never think that suffering in and of itself is good, even if sometimes good can come out of it? Inside Story. Our mission story this week is titled Jesus, Miracle Doctor, and it's by Andrew McChesney. Sengfet was a highly regarded medical doctor at the largest hospital in one of the provinces of Laos, but he was powerless to cure his son's disease. His adult son came down with the mysterious illness while working in Bangkok, Thailand. The young man was treated by Bangkok physicians, but did not get better. So Dr. Sengfet, not his real name, brought his son back to Laos and treated him at his hospital. The young man's condition, however, did not improve. Fellow physicians suggested seeking treatment at a big hospital in Laos's capital, Vientiane. Dr. Sengfet brought his son to the Vientiane hospital, where he underwent multiple tests. In the end, the physicians could find nothing wrong with his physical health. They concluded that the problem was psychological and that he had suffered a mental breakdown. All the medical tests took more than a year, so Dr. Sengfet and his wife spent all their money on their son, but to no avail. If they had known the Bible, they would have been able to relate to the story of the woman with the flow of blood, who had suffered many things from many physicians. She had spent all that she had and was no better, but rather grew worse. Mark 5.26 They brought their son home, and in a desperation similar to the woman with the blood issue, finally turned to the heavenly physician Jesus. They prayed in their bedroom for Jesus to heal their son. As they prayed, their son walked into the bedroom. "'What happened?' he asked. "'Why do I feel peace all of a sudden?' Dr. Sengfet and his wife kept praying. Then the son had what he described as a vision. He saw an evil spirit leaving his body, saying, "'I can no longer stay because Jesus has laid claim over your life. You belong to Jesus.'" That day, The son returned to normal, and Dr. Sengfet and his family started worshipping Jesus. For months, Dr. Sengfet made no secret about his love for Jesus, telling everyone who would listen, Dr. Jesus Christ healed my son and my family, and I have accepted him as my saviour. After some time, however, Dr. Sengfet stopped worshipping Jesus. He seemed to forget how Jesus had healed his son, and he returned to his former ways. Please pray for him and the others who have been touched by Jesus but no longer worship him. Please pray that they will return to him again. This mission story illustrates some of the challenges that Seventh-day Adventists face in fulfilling the Church's I Will Go strategic plan, including Mission Objective Number 2, to strengthen and diversify Adventist outreach among unreached and underreached people groups and to non-Christian religions, and spiritual growth objective number five, to disciple individuals and families into spirit-filled lives. Part of this quarter's 13th Sabbath offering will go toward opening an elementary school in Laos, helping to fulfil mission objective number four, to strengthen Seventh-day Adventist institutions in upholding freedom, holistic health and hope through Jesus, and restoring in people the image of God. Learn more at IWillGo2020.org This lesson was read by Dr. Percy Harold for Christian Services for the Blind. Sponsored by the Sabbath School Department and distributed through Hope Channel Australia, this podcast is also redistributed by Hope Channel Germany, Christian Record Services for the Blind, and It Is Written. It is also available on SoundCloud and through multiple podcast distributors, including Apple iTunes. Remember, God is always faithful.